We got a, a guy that um, is changing the world. I'm going to read you a little bit of his bio. Joe and I are, and we're going to show you a little video on top of that. You've probably seen them before. Tom Peterson is the president and founder of CatholicsComeHome.org. Following 25 years, 25 years as an award-winning advertising executive, Tom Peterson's radically life would radically change forever after receiving a transforming spiritual conversion while on a Catholic men's retreat. Soon afterward, he founded Virtue Media, a pro-life media, and CatholicsComeHome.org. And get this, get this, everyone, listen carefully. In the first six years, six years of Catholics Come Home, as they have aired Catholic evangelization, evangelicals, I love that, in 37 dioceses and nationally reaching 125 million viewers. They have helped, they have helped lead over 500,000 souls home to the Catholic Church. Now, I, I, going off script here on this, um, I, I have said numerous times there are few uh, organizations and ministries that I am this passionate about, but bringing Catholics back home to the church is one of them. And this man is living proof that it can and does happen. In fact, this Sunday at 5 p.m., that's actually at today, 5 p.m., and Thursday at 9 p.m. Central, Tom is hosting a new primetime television series worldwide on EWTN. This show is called Catholics Come Home and inspires Catholics to share their stories of faith. Peterson's second apostolate, virtuemedia.org, and I'm going to say it again, virtuemedia.org, creates and airs Sanctity of Life commercials, helping as many as 22,000, 22,000, abortion vulnerable women in a given month. And they do so by airing their ads on MTV and BET, places in the world that we would not expect to see a positive Catholic message. He's reaching out and finding these women and speaking to their hearts and helping the pro-life issue on the front lines. Let's watch a sample of these powerful ads. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church, with over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith. Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look Visit CatholicsComeHome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. For victory in life, we've got to keep focused on the goal. And the goal is heaven. The key to winning is choosing to do God's will and love others with all you've got. Sacrifice, discipline, and prayer are essential. We gain strength through God's Word. And we receive grace from the sacraments. And when we fumble due to sin, and it's going to happen, confession puts us back on the field. So if you haven't been going to Mass weekly, get back in the game. We're saving your seat on the starting bench this Sunday. Welcome home. So many of us carry such heavy burdens. You're crazy! Deep within, we struggle. Come on, babe. It'll be fun. Because sin separates us from God. She's having a relationship with George. But thanks to the grace of confession, God compassionately listens, forgives, and sets us free. So if it's been a while since you've been to confession or mass, come home and experience a fresh start. Visit catholicscomehome.org. Shining through darkness, Advent joy lights the night air. 
for kindly Saint Nicholas was making his way there. But wait for a moment, there's a pause in his plan. We're reminded Santa's priority should be that of every woman and man. For peace to flourish and love to abound, our souls must come home. The King of Kings must be found. For centuries, wise men sought the Savior first. Knowing only Jesus can quench our heart's greatest thirst. So come home to Mass and celebrate the holy Christian season. For love is born tonight. Our hope for heaven, the reason. In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and the Catholic faith. Their stories are incredible. I would have called myself an agnostic for about 17 years, 17 years away from God, where my focus was on myself. I was happy being an atheist. God just never came into my mind. I cursed and yelled and screamed at God. I grew up in Oklahoma. You Catholics, they're like zoo animals. You find one, you're like, oh my gosh, what is this? I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe God's mercy is reaching the hearts of returnees, converts, agnostics, and atheists through creative media, helping to bring them home. Join us as we travel across North America with incredible stories of redemption as the Holy Spirit transforms souls. This is Catholics Come Home. Ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, Tom Peterson. My world changed. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Wonderful. You know, uh, when you are a speaker, God really teaches you that all things are from him that are good. And we shouldn't get overconfident. You know, you're speaking in a big arena like this. It's easy to get a big head. But I'm reminded of a story <laughs> where God uh, taught through a Catholic lady. I was in Phoenix giving a speech at my old home parish. And I'm standing there waiting to come on. And the lady at the AV desk was there. And she said, oh, I have seen you on Fox News all the time. I've seen you on EWTN all the time. And I said, oh, have you? And I started to get a big head. And she says, yeah. She says, you look much older in real life. <laughs> so God has a way of providing us humility when we need it most. My, uh, my speech today is our world needs Catholic heroes. And I don't think there's anyone here who would disagree with the fact that we truly need some Catholic heroes in our world today. But I'm going to start in a little bit of an unconventional way with a story about squirrels. Now, some of you may be turning your hearing aids up or saying to your wife, did he say squirrels? I did say squirrels. You'll see how this story ties in with Catholicity and the new evangelization pretty soon. Many of you know I lived in Phoenix for 36 years, and we moved to Atlanta. And as you can imagine, the Phoenix deserts are completely different than the tree-filled areas of Atlanta. Well, when we moved to Atlanta, we moved to Roswell, Georgia area, where there's three churches on the same street. We have the uh, Southern Baptist Church, the United Methodist Church, and our parish of St. Peter Chanel. Each one of them had lots of trees around there, and with that came millions of squirrels. Each one of them had a squirrel infestation, but they dealt with the problem differently. First, we'll start with the Baptist church. The Baptist church, the preacher said, I have an idea. They baptized by immersion, as you know. So he lured the squirrels into the baptismal font with some food. He put a lid on the top, put a fire hose in the back, and said, I've got the problem solved. Well, those pesky critters were quite industrious. They ate a hole out the backside, and next day, 3,000 squirrels at the Baptist church. 
We moved down the street to the United Methodist Church. That pastor said, we would never do anything like that to harm God's creatures. We're United Methodists. We believe in live and let live. So he gently and humanely trapped those squirrels. He drove them to the other side of town and released them to God's green nature because that's what they do. He was a United Methodist. Well, sure enough, the next day, 5,000 squirrels at the United Methodist Parish. We then go and end up at my church of St. Peter's Chanel down the street. And Monsignor McNamee says, oh, those boys have it wrong. I know exactly what to do. He brought the squirrels in. He baptized the squirrels. He registered those squirrels as parishioners. And he gave them church envelopes. And now we may see the squirrels sometimes at Christmas and every now and then at Easter. <laughs> oh, oh, sh Oh, sure. Oh, sure. We laugh about that, but that's why we're here today, because there's so many of our loved ones we may only see at Christmas and Easter, and many times not at all. You know, being here in Iowa, you guys are in a political state, and I'm sorry to, for you that you're in a, a state with so much political stuff. It probably is very cumbersome sometimes, but we all remember and all love Abraham Lincoln. I mean, I don't think there's a soul who doesn't. And he had a very uh, telling line that he used to say. He said, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing will fail. But without public sentiment, nothing will succeed. Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, knew this phenomena well when he said, talking about the new evangelization, Using media correctly and competently can lead to a genuine enculturation of the gospel. But new methods are needed, as is new ardor, so new enthusiasm. He knew that it could usher in a springtime of hope. But you and I know that sharing the Catholic faith and getting good press from the media is far from common. They usually don't have much good to say about us. And I think about especially our last beloved pope, Pope Benedict, I mean, they didn't have anything good to say about him. I often wonder if he came to America and he were to, let's say all the reporters were in Washington, D.C., and he were to literally walk on the water, maybe the Potomac, and they would see this miracle of the Holy Father walking on water, I somehow wonder if the anti-Catholic press would spin that that blessed event, that miracle, to be a little different the next day. I think the morning papers might read, the Pope can't swim. They would literally take a miracle of walking on water and somehow it would end up a little less miraculous. But you and I are here today to share good news about Jesus and his holy Catholic Church. Good news that has penetrated hearts and through the Holy Spirit has brought over a half a million or more home to God and his church. Good things can certainly happen. But you know, if we don't spread the good news, people will fall further away. More than ever, the United States is missionary territory in terms of spreading Christ in the Catholic faith. Do you know that only 6% of the United States are faithful practicing Catholics? Now, some of you accountants in the room may say, well, I was following Tom up till now, but I thought we have 24% Catholics in the U.S. Well, your math is right. But the fact of the matter is that three out of four do not practice the faith regularly. When we look at these statistics worldwide, we see that of the 1.2 billion baptized Catholics in the world, over 800 million never set their foot in the, in, into a church. Three quarters are away. This pains us and tugs at our hearts. Most of you have told me that you have a dear loved one, a close friend, relative, or neighbor who's away from the Catholic Church. It really affects 100% of us. St. Augustine talked about this problem. He said, our hearts are restless until they rest in God. And I know that problem well because I was a young, hard-charging businessman in Phoenix. I remember in business school, my mantra was, if it's going to be, it's up to me. I was driving 90 miles an hour on the Phoenix freeways because I had somewhere to go, I had stuff to do, and you all were in my way, and I had to scoot around you with my ego and my pride. But through God's grace on a married men's retreat, the Lord changed my heart. In front of the Eucharist, I had a supernatural experience with the living God, and he changed my heart instantly. He invited me to downsize and simplify. Downsize and simplify. Those are the two words I heard inside of my heart. And he taught me how I was living my life in the gray area, one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And I couldn't mix it that way. I needed to choose between God or not God, right or wrong. 
And he is so loving to us when he invites us to partake in, in his uh, uh, cooperative mission of saving souls and in living his holy will. I couldn't say no. I cried like a baby and my life had changed. That light switch went off. Maybe some of you have had similar experiences uh, on a cursio or some other uh, retreat event like that. Literally life-changing. Well, after that, I started praying to the Lord and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? These ministries, these apostolates were born shortly thereafter. You know, Jesus reminds us each and every day that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. In fact, as baptized Catholics, it's our duty to spread the faith. We're not always comfortable or know how to do that. But if we don't spread the good news of Jesus, the glitter and glamour of the world, those apparent hooks from the evil one, will pull us, our children, and our grandchildren even further away from God and his truth. Sir Edmund Burke once said very eloquently, the world is a dangerous place, but it's not just because of the evil people. It's because of the good people like us who simply don't do anything about it. You see, it's that lukewarmness that Christ warns us against. It's that apathy that we have to fight every day. I'd like to share a story with you of just how critical it is to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to a world in need. After that retreat, I started going to morning mass every day, and it made sense to me, and I was filled when I did. And when I followed God's will and I went to morning mass, my knots of the day were unknotted for the most part, and I'll tell you, life was easier. And when I just chose to do it Tom's way, I had all the problems of the day because I didn't put God first. Well, one day when I was going to morning mass, I remembered a pastor told me, pray every day to lead someone closer to Christ. We need to pray every day to lead someone closer to Christ. So that first time I did it, I said, okay, dear Lord, let me lead someone closer to you today. Amen. And I kid you not, that very first time I said that prayer, a Vietnamese lady tapped me on the shoulder after Mass. And she said, can I talk to you? We went back to the narthex because they were beginning the rosary. And she said, my son Jimmy has been away from the Catholic Church for over 20 years. Would you go talk to him? And I have to admit, the first thing I thought is, Man, isn't God quick when he wants you to do something? <laughs> he wasn't so good with the winning lottery numbers on my ticket that week, but nonetheless, he was quick on this. So I started asking him, what's the story? He said, he's been away from the church 20 years, and I'd like you to go talk to him, but don't tell him his mama sent you. No boy wants his mom meddling in his, in his business. I said, oh, my goodness. I said, well, where do I go? She says, he works at a nail shop down the street. Well, I'm pretty dumb because I'm a guy, and I have to tell you, I'm thinking Ace Hardware, True Value, Home Depot, no such luck. It was a Vietnamese nail salon that I had to go to. <laughs> so here I am in my suit. I didn't know what to do. I had never done this before, so I go home and grab my Curcio crucifix and some stuff out of my drawer, and I proceed to drive to see Jimmy. I walk in the place, and I said, are you Jimmy? And he said, who wants to know? And I said, this is starting off great. And I said, somebody who loves you, the God of the universe, and I want to invite you back to the Catholic Church. You could have heard a pin drop. Hello. <laughs> Woo. That was a good special effect. Thank you. <laughs> it, was de it was dead silent. <laughs> And I remember from my sales training, they said, after you ask for the sales, stand there. So I stood there for like what seemed like 10 minutes. It was probably a few seconds. And Jimmy spoke first, and he said, oh, I'm a professional fisherman. I used to fish for my supper in Vietnam. I don't, I don't need to go to church. I find God in nature. Huh? Have we heard that one before? And I said, Jimmy, we can find God in nature. He created it all. But... Like a cross, we can have that direct relationship with God that he wants so much, but he also, like the cross beam on the cross, has a community. We're all supposed to help each other in this tough world and love each other to heaven. That's his plan for the world. And Jimmy said, thanks but no thanks, and I left on my way. More often than not, the Holy Spirit would turn my head, and I'd see Jimmy's nail salon, and I'd feel the, uh, uh, compelled to go in and visit him. And I kid you not, on two occasions I invited Jimmy to Mass, and on two occasions Tom was standing in the back of the church all alone. I was an abject failure in my eyes. But I'll tell you this, the third time was the charm. One Sunday morning Jimmy called me up and he said, Tom, what Mass are you going to? I said, my family's going 11 o'clock. He said, I'd like to go with you. And I said, Jimmy, what could have changed? You've stood me up twice and I've been back in that church all alone. 
He said, Tom, everything's changed. I said, what? He said, this time I went fishing on a Sunday morning like I always do, but I fished a crucifix out of the water. <laughs> and, and, and what he said next was really profound. He said, do you think it was a sign? <laughs> I said, Jimmy, it wasn't just a cross. It's a Roman Catholic crucifix, for goodness sake. Well, Jimmy did come to Mass, and I had, you know, told him some stuff. And I'll tell you, when he showed up, he was, you know, if you've ever gone to Mass in Arizona, it's pretty casual. People are wearing flip-flops and cutoffs and tank tops. It's kind of sad, but Jimmy didn't. Jimmy showed up to church in black dress pants, polished black shoes, a white shirt, tie. He looked more like the Mormon missionary that forgot his bike than he did a Catholic boy. <laughs> And what he said next, he was sweating. He says, where's the box? Where's the box? And I'm going, the box? What's he talking Ah, oh, Jimmy wanted to go to confession because he knew he couldn't receive until he went to confession. So Jimmy went to confession. He was a new man, came back. Fast forward three months. Jimmy calls me and says, I've met the girl of my dreams. Isn't God good? And they went through the Vietnamese RCIA program together on the other side of town. Six months after that, we show up to his church. And I'm here to tell you at that mass... The only words we understood were amen and alleluia, which are the same in every language. Isn't that a cool factoid? It's really cool. So we, we go to the reception afterward, and I'm telling you, it was, it was authentic, weird, old world Vietnamese cuisine. There was no sweet and sour or mushu on the menu. It was like, like slithery looking things and things with a lot of eyeballs in it. It looked more like an Indiana Jones movie than it did what I was used to. A couple of days later, he came over to my house with a big hunk of wedding cake and all his pictures developed, and he said, Tom, I need to talk to you. And my wife and three girls were there, and he says, I don't want to talk to you in front of them. I need you to come with me. So he pulls me in the kitchen, and he says, Tom, I'm so grateful, and my mom's so grateful you invited me back to the Catholic Church. I said, Jimmy, I'm happy to help. No big deal. And he says, oh, it is a big deal. I said, what do you mean? He says, you don't know the whole story. I said, what story? He said, Tom, I was in the Asian mob in Los Angeles. I just got out of Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary after 15 years for felony crimes against humanity. At which point, all the blood rushed out of my socks, and I say, thank goodness I didn't know it ahead of time. I wouldn't have volunteered. <laughs> but what he said next was profound, and this is why I want to share it with you. He said, in prison, people had the time and took the time to talk about God. But in our busy world where we're all running around so much, very few people ever stop for a moment and help their neighbor and talk about God. Thanks for doing that. You've changed my life. And I'm telling you, it was like a sword that pierced my heart. How many Jimmies did I not help? I started thinking about all those Jimmies I blew off and I was too busy for them driving fast on the freeways doing my own thing. And it convicted me. Think about it in your lives. How many Jimmies are out there that are waiting for you to invite them back to be that Catholic hero God calls us to be? You know, George Orwell once said, in a time of universal deceit, and I think we're living in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes the revolutionary act. After airing the Catholics Come Home evangelization commercials, we've heard three common things. Current Catholics say those spots make me proud to be Catholic. They want to go deeper in their faith. They want to do more for the church, learn their faith more. They tithe more. They get more involved. The inactive Catholics, which is our prime market, say, I was watching those evangel commercials, and I just started tearing up. I felt like God was personally calling me home. And they rush right to Mass or, amazingly, to Confession. And some people were away for 35 years. One priest in Phoenix had 16 people in his confessional that had been gone since Vatican I. And he was amazed to hear their story that an evangelical brought them home, all through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When parishes asked people around the country, why did you come home? Do you know what the number one answer was? Because you invited me. Because you invited me. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if her heroism today means inviting somebody. We got a pretty easy task of it. Our brothers and sisters of old were fed to the lions, crucified upside down, burned at the stake. They had a whole lot tougher time. All we're being asked to do is invite people. And guess what? We're not doing it much. It doesn't take much to be a Catholic hero in today's world. Please, please, we all have to start doing more. 
Finally, the last category are those non-Catholics. I live in Atlanta now, the buckle of the Bible belt. We're amazed that so many people said, I didn't know this about the Catholic Church. I didn't realize Jesus started the church, the Catholic Church. I didn't realize Catholics brought the Bible to the world through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I didn't realize all the good they do in the world. I'd like to know more. We had 16 Southern Baptists at my parish alone that inquired about becoming Catholic. It's amazing how this fruit spreads beyond what any human beings would ever conceive. But that's the way God and the Holy Spirit works. We've witnessed incredible stories like you saw on that clip from our new EWTN series from atheists, converts, and reverts who just needed to know that they were loved by God and loved by you and me in the church. Like Jimmy, there's millions of these people who need to be invited back, who need to help find their way home. We need to love more souls to heaven. Why? It's the prime mission we exist as the Catholic Church. Jesus commands us to spread the good news. We're not doing it enough. Feeding the poor is great. Clothing the naked is great. Doing all those humanitarian things are great. But I'm telling you, in God's eyes, and Scripture confirms that the number one reason we exist as a church is to evangelize the world. When we do this, all those other good things fall into place and happen. But if souls don't know Christ, then we've missed the main mission. And when we do his will, it's like a rising tide that lifts all ships. Marriages and families grow stronger. Our priestly and, and uh, vocations for our nuns and deacons and all grow stronger. And more souls journey toward heaven. You know, over the years, we've learned how education and catechesis is a key, essential component for changing things in society. If you look at prejudice years ago in the 50s, it was much worse, I, I hope you would agree, than it is now. We're making small strides in that area. If you look at that wonderful group, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, they've done an am amazing job of helping to educate the public. Don't have a couple of drinks and go out driving. Use a designated driver. They've also done a good in, in movies and in television shows of saying it's not glamorous to have a few drinks and going out driving. They've helped change the world for the better. And there's a campaign that many of you over the age of 40 or 50 will remember. Back in the early 1970s, it was a public service announcement that helped us as Americans to stop littering. What or who was that individual in that public service announcement that helped prompt people to stop littering? An Indian, a Native American chief, remember the tear going down his eyes? How is it that all of you seem to remember a PSA announcement for the early 70s, what, 40, 50 years ago, and yet we do? It helped change this. I often tell people I remember it was common when I was growing up in the Chicago suburbs for people to go to McDonald's and throw the trash out the window afterward. There were cups on the side of the road all the time. It's horrifying to us today to think if we saw that how we would feel. Back then it was common. So you see people and, and catechesis and education can help change that pendulum and help move people in a new direction. My brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit is calling us to do the same and help bring souls back to God and to heaven, not only with media, but in our personal lives. But if we don't do this, the distractions of the world will bring people further away from God. My wife and I were watching a pretty good television program a few months ago on ABC. I think it's on Friday nights called, What Would You Do? Have some of you seen that show? It's a pretty good show where the producers set up moral and humanitarian dilemmas where they uh, put hidden cameras around and they'll set up scenarios and see how people react. If you've watched a show like we have, maybe there's an episode where a guy's laying in the street and they'll see, will any passerbys help him? Then they'll take the guy out and they'll put a, women, a woman there and they'll say, will more people help the woman than they did the guy? Or they'll put a teenager in there, will more people help the... And they study society. If you've seen the show like my wife and I did, you'll find usually there's a couple of different reactions. Most people walk by and they're looking at the guy in the street staring at him, but they do absolutely nothing. Every now and then, the person uh, is a little more coy who comes by, and they'll walk by and they'll kind of do the sneak peek a couple times, but they stop and do nothing. And then once in a while, uh, a good Samaritan comes by, and they render aid to that person who needs it. John Keonis, the reporter, jumps out with his camera team, and they interview the person. Why did you stop? And invariably, that good Samaritan says, I couldn't pass by my neighbor and not help him. I would want someone to do it for me. 
See my brothers and sisters in Christ, that show convicted me and my wife. How often have I passed by that person in the street? More often than not, it's a guy who says, hey, can you spare a few bucks for food? I could have taken him in the subway and bought him a sandwich. Most times he's hungry, but instead in my mind, what do we do? The evil one says, oh, he's going to use it for something that's not good for him. He's going to do that. He puts all these excuses. God doesn't want us to care about that. He just wants us to show love and mercy. Now, it's more prudent instead of giving money to buy him a sandwich. That's true. But we have to see whether it's that situation or a million others that happen in our lives. How many times have we walked past the jimmies? How many times have we walked past the guy laying in the street or whatever the scenario is, and we've denied helping that, that person in need created in the image and likeness of Christ? You know, there's a prep school math dilemma that helps kind of break this topic open more. It shows about delayed gratification. We Americans are usually pretty, well, the world in general now is usually pretty uh, uh, short-fused. We want everything now. We don't want to wait. We're impatient. And a uh, high school math uh, teacher puts this dilemma forth to his prep school class. He tells the class, I've got an option for you today. I will either give you a penny that will double every day for the next 30 days, or I will give you $10,000 cash right now. Which would you take? Well, as you can well imagine, those students are probably pretty impatient. They'll say, give me the quick fix. I'll take the 10000 in cash right now, the sure thing. But in doing so, they or we would be settling for 10,000 times less than the $10.6 million that that penny becomes, doubling to two, four, and so forth on the 31st day. And God uses that to remind us, how often do you and I settle for that quick fix, that earthly pleasure, that immediate delight? A good sometimes, but not the greatest good of doing God's will exactly how he wants us. Not the greatest good of focusing on heaven, the eternal rewards, but some creature comfort of this earth instead. We need to learn detachment. We need to learn more appropriately of following God's will and the promptings of the Holy Spirit every single day. When we do this, good things happen, and the world develops more Catholic heroes. You know, each day, you and I are called by the Holy Spirit to a sense of detachment, giving up those hooks, those things that have us addicted. And each one of us has a different set. Uh, we have to relinquish those things that have trapped us in the past. Mine happened to be a lot of exotic cars. When I was making a lot of money in my young days and, and so forth, I was kind of hooked on automobiles, and I put way too much priority on nice cars, buying them off the showroom floor, different varieties. So I had gone to a more austere li lifestyle that God called me to working in the nonprofit world, and I started driving Honda Accords, Toyota Camrys, white four-door, very simple, very good cars. Well, one particular day I got home from a speech, and it, it was a particularly good one, and I was feeling pretty good about myself, which is the first uh, step toward, toward falling. And I get to a traffic light in, it, in the suburbs of Atlanta, and I look over, and there is a brand new Lexus. I don't know about you, but the fit and finish and paint jobs on those cars is pretty good. Now, I started looking at it, and I started the dangerous game of playing let's make a deal with God. Now, here's how it worked for me. Well, gee, God, that Lexus looks pretty nice. But you know what? It's only the baby one. It's the IS250. It's really not that expensive. It's only $6,000 more than my Camry would be new. And you know what? Even though gas is over $3, it's engineered so well, it gets pretty good gas mileage. And after all, Father, you love me so much, you want the best for your children. I think you would want me to have that little Lexus, wouldn't you, Dad? And I didn't give him a chance to respond at all. Before he knew it, I started talking again and yammering on. And I said, in fact, God, if you don't want me to go shopping for that little Lexus this weekend, I'd like you to make it, and this has become known as the Tom Peterson prayer, abundantly clear like a two-by-four over my head. Otherwise, I'm not going to go. And I drove off when the light turned green to go get my hair cut. Well... I was in the haircut place, there was a guy before me, and I started rifling through the magazines trying to find something to do for the five minutes until the guy's haircut was finished. I don't know if God gave me a sign or not, but I'll let you decide it. I pulled a magazine out of the rack, and I actually stole it, and if there's priests here, I have confessed it. You'll find that it was worth, it was worth stealing it. I pulled this out, Automobile Magazine, and I'll hold it up. 
The headline reads, Satanic Lexus. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of sort of thought the good Lord was giving me a little hint that maybe I didn't need to have that car now. I was tell, telling Jim Becker, who's part of the Catholic Medical Association, and he heard me speak there a couple years ago. When I told this story at the Catholic Medical Association, there were about 800 doctors in the room, and about three-quarters of them were squirming after it because they were driving Lexuses. <laughs> so I'll give you the disclaimer. If you're driving a Lexus, enjoy it. I'd love a ride afterward. But you know what? Maybe that's not your area that needs detachment. It was mine. I put an overemphasis into stuff like that. It was bringing me away from my spiritual life. But ask yourself at this point, what are the things that you are uh, addicted to or that are causing you to not have that full relationship with Jesus? That would be your story. In his book, Jesus Shock, Dr. Peter Crave teaches, our culture has filled our heads but it's emptied our hearts. It's stuffed our wallets, but it's starved our wonder. It has fed our thirst for facts, but not for meaning or mystery. Here's the pivotal line. It produces nice people, not heroes. Our world is in desperate need of heroes. We're living in this lukewarmness. A prior issue of U.S. News and World Report showed the growing divide between people of faith between the atheists and between the Christians, it's bigger than ever. Do you know that groups like Methodists, Scientologists, Mormons, and even atheists are advertising nationally now? The billboards, bus benches, and ads from the atheists are stop worrying and start living, forget God, where there's things they're telling our children like sleep in on Sundays, don't go to church. These are the messages they're promulgating. I'm here to tell you as a businessman, I don't understand the business matrix. Think about it. Why would someone spend their hard-earned money to convince someone else not to believe in someone or something that they don't believe in? If you don't like Brussels sprouts, would you take money out of the bank to create an ad to convince people not to eat Brussels sprouts? No way. It's illogical. So why are the atheists spending millions of dollars to convince you and your children and grandchildren not to follow God? It doesn't make sense. I'll tell you why. They've tipped their hand. St. Paul got it right. We are not fighting a war of flesh and blood. It's of principalities and powers. We either serve God or we serve the enemy. Just that simple. We know Jesus won the battle, but St. Paul tells us we have to run the race. He calls us to cooperate and never give up. I lived in Phoenix for 36 years. How many of you have visited the valley of uh, Phoenix area? A lot of you have. Hopefully not in summer. It's pretty hot. But when, if you've gone to Phoenix, on the east side of town, there's a mountain range called the Superstitions. And that's where the old prospectors used to dig for gold and silver. And it reminds us of a good lesson to learn. The story goes that a prospector found a golf ball-sized nugget of gold. He worked that claim, worked that claim, and after two weeks he found nothing else and he gave up. The next dusty prospector who came along found the largest gold strike in Arizona history. Get this, one foot from where the first guy left off. It teaches us the gift of fortitude that we must never give up on serving God. We must never give up on praying for those loved ones away from the faith. And one of the best ways to do it, a priest told me, is when the priest consecrates the precious blood at Mass and holds up the chalice, name those loved ones and put them in the precious blood of Jesus because Jesus cares more about their salvation than we could ever dream of. So many of you have talked to me at the book table. My son's away. My daughter's away. I see the pain on your heart. At Mass, pray for Jesus to have someone help them home. Pray for something in their life to touch them, to bring them home. And let's not give up like the first prospector. Let's learn from him. As I come to near the end of my speech, I'll tell you one last story about an airline uh, a flight I took. I was coming back from Wichita, Kansas. And I was pretty excited because I got an upgrade on Delta. So I figured I'm going to get first class. I might even get breakfast. So I get on the plane and get this. There was no first class. The crew before us took our plane and left us with the tired old one with regular seats. All the business people were pretty upset because the seats were all discombobulated. But the flight attendants were very good at getting everybody calmed down. About 20 minutes later, we took off. 
as the flight attendants were coming down with the drink cart. My heart bled for them because I saw how hard they were working and how they got a lot of bent, out of shape guys calmed down quickly. So when they came to me, I said, you know, even though we don't have a first class section, you're treating us all like first class flyers. Thank you for doing that. And I'm telling you, they thought I gave them a Christmas present. The one flight attendant named Jesse said, oh, thank you so much. I've had the worst morning of my life. In fact, I've had the worst month of my life. And I said, I'm happy to do it. I see how hard you're working. They served drinks to the rest of the plane. And then on their way back up, Jesse tapped me on the shoulder again. She says, thanks again for the kind word. And I nodded and said, you're very welcome. You're working hard. You deserve it. How often do we thank people who help us, people who put on this, the guys behind the stage who are working so tirelessly that we don't even see them, the person who's pouring water at the restaurant. We have to start thanking those unseen heroes more often. So anyway, the flight attendants go on. We're about 20 minutes before landing in Atlanta, and I saw five rows up the two flight attendant ladies talking to each other. I don't know what the conversation was about. But Jesse had a problem. The other flight attendant was ministering to her, and she was in a world of hurt. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I, I felt led to just say a prayer for her. And I said, Lord, i got to do more. What do you want me to do? And I don't know if this was from the Holy Spirit or maybe the spicy omelet I ate that morning. But I took out a, I heard practice what you preach, and I took out a Catholics Come Home evangelization card. They're on our table outside booth 74 that's up that stairwell. And you can help yourself to one. It says Catholics come home, we are family, welcome home. And it's got the website on it, blank on the back. So I said, now what? And again, I didn't know if it was the Holy Spirit or the spicy omelet, but here's what I wrote. Jesse, the hope that you seek can only come from Jesus and his church. God loves you, Tom. Now that's a real weird thing to write to a stranger who I don't know what her problem is. I don't know what her faith background is. I know nothing about her. So I read it again, and I said, let me see if it's true. Her name is Jessie. The hope that she seeks can only be found in Jesus and his church. God does love her, and my name is Tom. So I knew it was true. <laughs> but I'm a bit of a chicken, so I said the famous Tom Peterson prayer, Lord, if you really want me to give this to her, I need you to hit me over the head with a two-by-four, otherwise I'm not doing it. I put the card face down in my lap, and I cheated. I put my nose in a book so I wouldn't see Jessie's eyes. Well, as the Holy Spirit would have it, she came and tapped me on the shoulder as she's going to the jump seat in the back. She said, thank you again for your kind word. And I said, you're welcome. I handed her the card. I knew I had to. God set it up. But I was again a chicken. I handed it to her face down. And I said, read it when you get off the plane. I'm telling you, when those doors opened to let people off, even though I was in the fifth row, I was jumping over old ladies and luggage. I was, a, <laughs> I was the second person off that plane because I'm so stinking scared. I got home, and I'll tell you, Jessie looked up our website, and she wrote me a letter, and I'll read it to you verbatim. My name is Jessie. You were on my flight, and you handed me a note on the back of a card. How did you know I was so desperately in need of that message? I want to thank you. I have not stopped crying since I went to your website to look up your address. Here's the ooh part. I was raised Catholic but have been away from the church and God for so many years. It goes on to say, I'm recently divorced, which was her problem, and I'm struggling with the emptiness and loneliness of being alone. I've been searching for a man to be in my life, and I found that man. It's God. I came home to church last weekend. In a... And I sent her a book. I sent her some encouragement. I said, keep going. I'm praying for you. She sent me a note a few weeks later that says, Tom, I'm trying to follow that advice of helping love somebody to heaven and, and helping each day to pray to lead someone closer to Christ. And it happened. On my last flight of the day, all my crew members went home late. But I stayed and I helped a pregnant lady with three toddlers, a cat, and a stroller and two carry-on bags get from one concourse in Atlanta, the busiest airport in the world, to the next concourse. I got home from work an hour late, but guess what? It never felt so good because I was helping someone in need. You see, she was paying it forward. Jesse was understanding. 
Praise God. Jesse was understanding that that ripple effect, when you throw the pebble in the stream goes out, or the domino effect, you help one person, they help another. That's how love changes the world for the good. That's what Christ is calling us to do each and every day, to put our own needs on the side and to help spread the love that will change others. Our world needs the new evangelization. Here are five simple ways to start. Number one, when I asked you how you were today, most of you said, I'm fine, I'm good. I propose, and I set you up when we did that, didn't I? <laughs> I propose we change our language. And when someone says, how are you, we answer, I'm blessed, how are you? I'm blessed, how are you? Now notice, I didn't put my Atlanta twang and attitude on it and say, I'm blessed, brother, how are you? I, simp <laughs> I simply... I love doing that. I, I, I'm not even from the South, but I love doing it. I simply, I simply use my Catholic voice, and, I, and with, in honesty, you just do it with sincere humility. I'm blessed. How are you? Even if we don't feel like it, guess what? We are blessed, huh? I said that today to at least 30 people, and two people answered, well, I'm blessed too. I'm actually very thankful to God. We need to know that God is blessing us all the time, and we are blessed. And guess what? It takes that negativity in the world, and it changes it to a positive. It really helps us to realize how thankful we are for the blessings God gave us. Number two way, if somebody is complaining at work or you meet on the street, and let's face it, everybody's telling you their problems, I propose we start saying, how can I pray for you? We did this going door to door with the first Catholics Come Home campaign. And we said, we're going to pray for you and your family at our church for four hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament. How can we pray for you? And I'm telling you, there wasn't a Mormon. There wasn't an atheist. There wasn't an inactive Catholic Methodist. I don't care what they were that didn't appreciate a free prayer. Everybody seemed to have someone with cancer in their family or lost their job or a kid, kid in some turmoil or something that appreciated the free prayer. And I propose that when someone says to you their problems, we say, how can I pray for you and may I pray for you now, right now, on the spot. And I'll tell you what that does. How many times have we said to people, I'll pray for you, and we go home and we completely forget it two seconds later, huh? I'm guilty of that. You at least get one good prayer in that God hears immediately. But I'll tell you something else I've noticed. The supernatural happens. The Holy Spirit cues that person up and you remember them the next day in the Adoration Chapel, saying the rosary at Mass, driving in the car, and you remember to pray for Mary who asked you for the prayers. Number three way. Watch the Catholics Come Home television show on EWTN. T tonight at 5 p.m., next Thursday at 9, it repeats as episode 4. It's a show that helps you feel more comfortable about the new evangelization. You can see the miracles that happen when we do something as heroic as stepping out and showing love to someone else. It's just that simple. Lives can change for eternity. Okay, the next way. Pray for Catholics come home to be in Iowa. We've talked about it for three years. I've met with everybody. We've had dates. The dates have changed. Pray again for the Holy Spirit to lead us to the right date in 2015 or 16 here in the Diocese of Des Moines to launch Catholics Come Home. Pray hard for that. And finally, if you would, do me an act of mercy by buying a Catholics Come Home book afterward. We don't actually sell them. We ask for a donation. All the money goes to create and air more of those national and local evangelization commercials and pro-life ads. And you'll be doing me an act of mercy that I don't have to ship back or carry back 500 very, very heavy books. <laughs> The book is actually not designed for the relatives away. It's designed for you and me to help us feel more comfortable about sharing the faith, about these stories that have literally changed people's lives. Cardinal Dolan has endorsed it. Um, Roma Downey from Touched by an Angel. A lot of Catholic heroes have endorsed the book. Scott Hahn wrote the foreword. For that reason alone, it's a good book. But incredible stories of a car that comes crashing through the front of our house. Another story about how I'm doing a graveside interment with a bunch of biker dudes. It really has some cool stories how God has used people in weird situations to help others home. Please, please buy a book up at table 74 after my speech. I'll only be here through the beginning of Mass, so if you want one, pick one up for yourselves and get one for someone you love or leave one in your Adoration Chapel. And as I come to a conclusion, as my time comes to an end, I'm going to ask you, if you remember only one thing in my whole presentation, remember this. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. 
Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You see, love is going to change the world, not how smart we are, not how many facts and figures on the Catholic history we have. It's that love, that authentic love you show others that's going to touch their heart like Christ uses other people to touch our hearts, and it will change the world for the better. And if I were to ask you or someone on the street were to ask you the pivotal question, how are you today, what would your response be? Ah, oh, your quick studies here in Iowa. God loves you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you at my table afterward. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you so much. All glory to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention one thing to make it easy on our... I'm going to mention one thing to make it easy on our table volunteers. We don't sell anything, so when you come to the table, there's a little envelope. You fill out the information on the very bottom part, cash, check, or credit card. It's our way to, to get, give you a book through a donation without tax. It's a pain in the neck. Just offer it up, and, uh, but I wanted to let you know. God bless you all. Mackenzie's up there signing books. Yeah, I got it. Tom, thank you so much, and what, what, a, what a blessing.